Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, great. Well, this is my first time at Qubits, and I'm excited to be here and presenting. Um, well, I'll be talking about our company's LDI MindTree's approach to taking quantum computing and its value to our customers and industry in general. So this is, of course, in partnership with Qubits, uh, sorry, with uh, D-Wave, and we've been doing some fantastic work, which I'll try to also showcase. Right, so some of you may not know who LTI Mindtree is, and let me introduce our company. We are a global um, technology consulting company and a digital solutions company. We are about 81,000 strong, uh, serve about 700 plus clients across the world. Some of them are really at the top. <clears throat> And what we do is try to help our clients tread the path of digital transformation, be it business model transformation, experience transformation, tech ecosystem transformation, or whatever it be it, right? We try to help the clients through innovation. We redefine their business both from inside out and outside in. So our parent company is called Larson & Tubro which is a major engineering company in India. If you come to India anytime, you will not miss the logo L&T because uh, they are into heavy civil development or uh, anything and everything, even the airport constructions or whatever be it, right? So you will not miss L&T. And they are a very uh, technology innovate, innovative company as well because we also helped in India's moon mission uh, program just uh, last year, I think. Right, we are present all over the world, so anywhere you want us, you should be able to find us very easily. We are headquartered in Mumbai, India. Now, I'm from a, a group called Technology Incubation Group within the CTO's office of uh, LTI Mindtree. And what we do there is build new capabilities, right? And one of the technologies that we're incubating is quantum computing along with D-Wave. There are 11 different verticals that LDI Mindtree serves in, from banking and financial services to retail, energy, utilities, healthcare, and life sciences. And we have experts in each of these domains, right? Because we have been working with clients for so long, we do know um, and have the domain expertise as well. So with, together with them, what we did was identify some use cases that are uh, important and probably ones which can get value out of quantum computing almost as of now, right? So for example, in banking and financial services, it's the portfolio optimization or fraud detection. Um, in retail, it could be the vehicle routing problems. In energy, it's the blending and scheduling optimization problem and, well, employee scheduling is also applicable to healthcare, which, which we call as the nurse scheduling pro problem, sorry. So in our group, what we do is we have um, amazing researchers, quantum researchers, mathematicians, and uh, quantum native developers. We have uh, subject matter experts who are working with clients. And together with partnership, uh, strategic partnership with D-Wave, we will be able to bring value across industries and so on. So what I'll do is give you sort of a sneak peek into some of the use cases that we are working on. Uh, some of these, like portfolio optimization, blending and scheduling, are also being worked upon with clients. So here, I'll be trying to give you uh, the core problem itself in, in, in a simplified sense, and would not be able to get into the more complex problems um, that actually are needed in the actual domain, right? So I'll start deep diving into portfolio optimization, but the other ones I'll just give an overview because uh, of the time crunch. So portfolio optimization, we have heard about this um, quite a bit in the last two days. The idea is that we have a bunch of money, right? A wealth uh, asset management company, for example, and they would like to invest in various stocks, funds, or other investment options where in, in long term, they'd like to, of course, seek um, investment returns 
large investment returns, while they want to be as risk-averse as possible, right? And that's pretty much the goal of everyone, whoever is trying to do in stocks. So what we did was we took this problem statements and we converted that to an optimization problem based on a theory called modern portfolio theory or Markowitz portfolio theory. This is one of the popular ones, but there are many, many other techniques in which you can do portfolio optimization, but this is the one we chose. So what does it look like? If you look at the center box there, the first objective is to maximize the return. Uh, w are the weights of the different assets that you're considering. And mu is the mean annualized returns that we have. So the idea is to in, you know, maximize this value, the product that you have out there. Second objective is minimizing the risk. You have the weights, and the sigma in between is actually the covariance matrix, which um, will help you figure out if there are any correlations between different stocks, especially if you're trying to diversify your investments. You want to minimize that. So that's the minimization problem, you know, objective that we have as a second one. When we put them together, it becomes um, you know, a quadratic problem, a nonlinear problem that we'd like to solve, right? And there are a bunch of constraints. Of course, you have a limited budget and you never want to exceed it. That's the basic constraint. Then comes target volatility. So an ideal case would be that you buy a stock at a dip and you sell it really at the top and that means you're going to maximize your profits. But as a wealth management company, you wouldn't want to do that. You want to make sure that your volatility is between a certain band, right? So maybe the swing should not vary uh, more than a certain standard deviation. So that's the target volatility constraints. The other one is portfolio, uh, sorry, portfolio cardinality. The idea there is, let's say you've identified 100 different stock options or you know, uh, other investment options. Now, you don't want to invest all in one, right? So uh, in, in one option. For example, sure, NVIDIA is doing great today. You don't want to put all your 100 million over there. It may do great, but that's not the best way to work with it. The idea is you want to set, let's say, a minimum. Uh, you want to spread your investment. So you say, I will invest about you know, at least in 30 different options so that the risk reduces, right? So that's the portfolio cardinality, which can be a band. You can say, I want to invest anywhere between 30 to 80 stocks out of the 100 ones that I've identified, or maybe 30 to 100, whatever you like. Now, within that, the next constraint comes as the investment band. Right, NVIDIA is a star stock at this moment, so if you want to invest in that, maybe I can say, look, I am interested to put about anywhere between 10 to 30% of my money into that, and the rest of that, the rest of the money should be spread over, right? So that's the investment band that you can do. Sector preference, yeah, you can indicate whether you want to invest in high tech, automotive, or whatnot, right, energy, and so on. Target written, you don't want it to be negative at any point, uh, but you can also specify, you know, I'd like to have about 8% or 10% of the returns. So that helps when we are trying to solve the optimization problem as to what is the minimum target that we should be uh, looking at and diversify um, based on that, right? So these are uh, some of the constraints that we got uh, and worked upon, but there could be many more that can be added to this depending on the kind of firm that we are working with and so on. Fine. We got the constraints, we got the mathematical problem. So what was the next part? We um, took the data, the OHLC data, that's open, high, low, close, uh, high, low, and close data for each asset, computed the returns and covariance, then put it in the CQM form necessary for D-Wave, ran the experiments on hybrid solver, and we saw some good results out there. So we got more diversified portfolios with good written options and especially high uh, sharp ratios, right? And not just that, the key takeaway from this uh, you know, sample set was that we were able to get um, 
you know, the values at a very high speed. That is, as the number of assets increase in a classical computational uh, model, the complexity goes up, but with this uh, QA-based approach, we were able to scale almost linearly. So that was really good. A sample result from our observations from one of the experiments is that you can see that the portfolio is sort of diversified and the kind of value that's got out of quantum in the bottom graph there is much higher as compared to a benchmark of S&P 500. Right, so moving on to the next use case, it's about blending and scheduling optimization. Here, uh, this is in the energy area. So the, here the idea is that, assume that you're an oil refinery company. Of course, you're getting the crude oil, you will store it, distill it, and you will have a bunch of components, right? Now, what you need to do is create products out of this. So even in the aviation industry, there are a bunch of products, not all of them are same, and they're created with something called recipes, right? The recipes are basically the ratios in which you're gonna mix different components. So each product has a certain price. As oil refinery company, you would, of course, want to maximize the amount of profits. So you want to create those uh, products which give you maximum returns and use the components uh, very well. You have a certain flow rate of each of these components, so considering that, the cost uh, of uh, you know, creating that particular product has to be considered as well, and you want, to minimize, you want to maximize the entire profits. We state it as a minimization problem, yes, but you just need to negate it in order to make it a maximization problem. Well, the constraints um, are pretty straightforward. Of course, the recipe or the final product must meet the recipe constraints. So for each product, there's usually a band, right, uh, of how much each component must be there. It's not exactly like one fixed point that you're gonna do. And based on how you vary this, you will get different product qualities. Even for your automobile, the gas, uh, gasoline that you use are of different qualities if you go to different uh, petrol stations, gasoline stations to fill them up, right? So it depends on, there's small variation in the components that are mixed. So this, again, um, is a nonlinear program, mixed integer linear program. Um, that's, that's the way we framed it. And we got some encouraging results again on, in this one. So on the top left, the pie charts basically indicate uh, you know, how different components were mixed for creating sample G1, G2, and G3, three different products of gasolines. And not just that, in this particular formulation, we just don't get how to mix, but it's also how do you schedule it so that you get the profits that you are trying to see on uh, when you're trying to do the optimization, right? So the scheduling is also done jointly, which greatly helps us. So this is a small problem that we have demonstrated here, but a larger scale problem can also be worked upon. Third one is employee scheduling problem, um, or let's say in this case, nurse scheduling problem. Uh, in a hospital scenario, you will have quite a lot of nurses, you will have quite a lot of patients as well. Of course, uh, the demand of the employee varies, there are some employees who have been working for long, so they also have their preferences that needs to be considered. Every employee has a certain duration that they have to work per week, um, and there may be some night shifts, they may have some preference also with respect to the number of shifts, and when they have night shifts, whether they want to do a day shift next day or take a break and so on, right? So all these things become constrained. The problem the, or the objective is that you want to maximize the assignment of shifts to a certain group of employees over a planning horizon, but you must never understaff or overstaff. Both of them create problems. Understaffing, of course, you'll not be able to meet the needs. Overstaffing, you're just spending too much money. So this again becomes a mixed integer programming problem. We uh, framed it in CQM form a framework and solved it with D-Wave to get some encouraging results again. Uh, here's a sample uh, result of about 20 employees on, that you see on the y-axis and different number of days how scheduling is done. So the schedule, well, it's pretty complex to read this way, but the schedule uh, was meeting most of the constraints that were necessary. 
and we want to try this on a much larger data set um, with, with, with D-Wave, right? So this was a sample set that we ran. The fourth one uh, is capacity vehicle routing problem with time window, so that's the additional constraint. So I think most of you may be familiar with the vehicle routing problem. We have been discussing that over the last two days as well. But here we have two things, that is capacity and time window. So every vehicle has, has a maximum capacity, and the delivery must be done within a pre-specified time window. Now, uh, this is not the open routing problem that we saw in the demo yesterday, but this is the cl a closed one where the vehicles start from a certain depot, they have to tour around, uh, and then come back, right? And each vehicle should be, uh, well, should be um, delivering to one exact place as much as possible and not try to repeat visiting other places as well. So this is an NP-hard problem, and uh, again, we frame this into the CQM framework. We've been working with the CQM framework of D-Wave uh, for quite a long time, and we're excited to try the NL solver that we saw yesterday. But for now, these are the results that we have about, uh, with this. And we found some encouraging results, but more fine tuning is necessary in order to obtain uh, much, much higher results. Uh, so we also tried this on a smaller scale problem, wherein there's a central depot that you see at the, cent oops, yeah, at the center, and a bunch of places were taken with a certain capacity and with, uh, and with a certain time window needs to be, uh, that needs to be delivered with. One of the things is that, of course, for this problem, we assume that we have knowledge of the traffic scenario as well, which is a dynamic one, and that's something that we want to take forward in the next one, right? Wherein we also try to bring in a bit more dynamicity to the entire problem statement. Right, so these are some use cases that we've been working on together with our industry partners in some cases, and um, the actual problems are a bit more complex than what I've demonstrated here. But, how do we want to take this to the industry, right? So that's the main uh, topic and problem. So as we see, every company who wants to adopt quantum computing or move towards quantum computing has to go through this journey of quantum awareness, preparedness, and value, right? So in awareness, it's just about education and training, finding out what quantum computing can do, and more importantly, what quantum computing cannot solve for you right, um, and making the stakeholders understand what it is, right, uh, how should the company think in terms of uh, its investment towards quantum computing. The second part is quantum preparedness, wherein the company should uh, try out some POCs, feasibility studies, right, and understand the value that it's actually getting out of it. And finally is the quantum value, where the value of the entire uh, quantum computing, whatever was seen in the POC phases or small scale pilots, is actually taken into production. Now, as we saw uh, in, an, in a talk earlier today, there are quite a few challenges there. It's not straightforward that, you know, uh, we saw some amazing results, let's say in portfolio optimization, we just take it and go and integrate, and we can't solve things in, in a silo. It's actually a big system, integration is a challenge. So that's where quantum, uh, well, that's where LTI MindTree comes into picture, wherein we offer services for all of these phases, trying to handhold organizations go from uh, you know quantum awareness phase all the way to the end, and together with uh, you know quantum ecosystem partnerships with D-Wave, we go together and provide probably you know, uh, education and training, joint workshops, or uh, you know, talk with the stakeholders, and create a strategy and roadmap that is necessary for them, right? Part of that advisory phase is also identifying the right use cases, uh, the way uh, quantum computing value can be leveraged, right? Apart from that, we also do quantum safe cybersecurity. That's not the point that uh, I'll stress upon here, but that's a separate point, separate service that we have. Once 
the advisory is done, the next phase, it naturally leads to the next phase where we will create POCs uh, and so on for the identified use cases because we have the talent pool uh, and the subject matter expertise on several domains, it'll be easy for us to step in, help uh, organizations move towards that. You know, the, uh, people don't really have to worry about what is this quantum physics and so on. It's, it's, we'll try to make it more easy, like the way D-Wave is democrati democratizing quantum computing. We are trying to get that reach to much more people through our uh, you know, expertise as well. Right, so quantum value is where we will be in, uh, taking it to production for some of the identified use cases and where, wherever we see value. So how do we do this? We have a jumpstart approach, simply a five-step approach, wherein the first step is discover, interactive and consulting workshops, uh, tools, you know, create that uh, whatever I've been talking about with respect to the strategy and roadmaps and so on. The second step is identify the right use cases, identify the challenges. It could be with respect to quantum computing or things around the entire system itself and the frameworks. And then next is to put things into uh, motion through experiments, small scale POCs, together with uh, you know, expertise that we have at D-Wave. We have a very close partnership that we work on we try to create those value, uh, you know, value chains that could be used. Finally, once we see this validation and benchmarking, we define what the transformation plan could be for a scaled implementation, how to take it to production, and how to sustain it in the long run, whatever the value has been seen. And once, yeah, we do have the plan, the next step is to move towards uh, the incremental value, right? So that's basically put it in production, make sure that things are working. And not just that, quantum computing is an evolving field. It's not just that, you know, I put things in motion, it's in production, I don't have to touch it anymore, no. There are gonna be new things coming up and so on, so there must be a continuous value uh, chain that must be updated and upgraded to the latest and greatest technologies so that the company stays at the forefront of its own innovation and products. So with that, I'd like to conclude the talk saying that we can get to the future faster together with D-Wave. And we'd love to uh, have more conversations. I'll be around, let me know, and we'll be happy to have more conversations on um, making quantum computing more viable for the industry and real world use. Thank you. <laughs>